What's good, you two? Happy holidays. Tuning in on this Sunday night. We're going to be talking cybersecurity. I had a conversation a couple weeks ago with Mr. O- Otha Marbury, Mabry, and he really inspired me. You all know that I've done a lot of mentorship and I am have a huge heart to help you all be successful in IT. And when I talked to Otha, he was sharing to me how he's been mentoring for years and just to hear the things he was doing, it really inspired me. And so I asked him to come onto the channel to talk about his career, his background, talk about cybersecurity and the things that he has done to help others be successful in this industry. So with no further ado, what's up, Otha? Thank you for joining us. Hey, how you doing, man? Thank you for having me on a Sunday night. You know, I definitely appreciate it. Um, you giving me the opportunity to talk about my origin story and, and some of the things that I've been doing and to learn from you and your audience. Hey, you know, I think it's inspiring to hear how you've had a heart to do this for so long. And not only the way you've done it, um, and we'll kind of get into that, how you've done presentations, you've done mentorships to help people get jobs, and you've just been doing it for years. And I think raising awareness around that, raising awareness around your user group is something that I really wanted to help you, you know, as much as I can. Thank you. Um, and, and I definitely appreciate that. And everyone has a, a different journey, how they get to that path of cybersecurity. And I still see myself as growing as well. So I don't think that I've gotten to that particular end game yet. So what I've been trying to do is allow others to learn from my mistakes, right? Uh, learn from my mistakes, learn from my wins, learn from the mistakes that I've seen others make, and then even learn from the wins and the insights and tips and tricks that I've learned from others, right? right. Um, I used to have this saying when I used to teach that every person is a sum of their error messages. You get paid on the amount of error messages you have seen mm -hmm. and error messages that you have uh, can solve, right? right? So the more you learn, the more you perfect your craft is the part of you getting to the point where you can be that subject matter expert or that go-to guy. Now, some people still may have imposter syndrome and even at times I have that as well, but I, I believe in being well prepared for, for anything, right? Uh, and the more prepared you are, the more better you will be at your craft. And the way I look at it is you, you have to get to the point where I'm going to be able to get a job and then I'm going to be able to get the salary that I want. And next, I want to be able to maintain that job and shine. And when I'm on that job, I look at it like I'm not happy to be here. I'm happy that this job is allowing me the opportunity to grow because sometimes companies aren't loyal to you. You know, and it may not be that they're shady. It may be that the bottom line, we got to lay people off. So every job I get on, I look at it like, look, this guy or this job is paying me to train. So I'm going to get everything that I can training at this particular job. Even in my career, when I had jobs where there's no training budget, you still have to prepare yourself. So I used to work at a university and we didn't have a training budget. So what I would do is call companies up and say, look, I want to do, I want to install voice over IP or, you know, some technologies are not there. And a company, that vendor will come to your place. They will give you demo equipment or allow, you know, to play around with. Even if you don't plan on installing that equipment, now you can take that as a learning opportunity, right? And then you just tell them at the end, hey, you know what? We didn't have the quota to get the equipment, but thanks. And then when the next company come by, yeah, I want to demo this. We want to lab it out. Let's do a POV. And then once it gets uh, to the point at the end of the POV, if you don't have money to buy the technology, don't feel bad. That's a training and a learning opportunity, right? Yeah. And the sales team or the account team for a particular vendor usually have to do a certain amount of POVs anyway. So they don't feel like it's wasting their time. They just feel that, okay, I got a POV going and it could go on the upside to, to, to sell for the company or it could not go. But they're going to try their best to establish a relationship with you and for you to learn that product. So even if your company doesn't have a budget or even if they do have a budget, you still have the opportunity to learn and grow at any company. Hey, that's a good point. In, in one of my last previous roles, um, 
Palo Alto was our vendor. And so Palo Alto has this thing where they have the PA220. It's a small, um, like, hub hub route or a spoke um, router or whatnot. And so I, I, hit, I hit hit up our, uh, our rep, like, hey, you mind if I get one of those PA220s, you know, so I can lab it up and get up to speed with Palo Alto? And he sent me one. I put it in my house and was using it, <laughs> like, my whole time there to learn how to use Palo so I can get up to speed. Now, granted... I couldn't use Panorama because we didn't have that, but I was able to get up to speed with every feature that Palos had just because I talked to the rep, just like you mentioned. Right. And then you put that on your resume and say, you know, I was the lead engineer for the POV of XYZ, yeah. right? And that shows, okay, you got experience and, and you add it to your resume and it just grows and grows, even if you're a help desk or whatever the case may be, you can take that title, that job, that role and responsibility and turn it into your own. And I think a lot of people have that problem of taking a role and turning it into their own, putting their own spin to that. And that makes you a successful network engineer, security engineer, network manager, whatever the case may be, when you're able to put your own spin on things, right? That's the truth. Um, so yeah, that, that's just something that, that I've always done. I always kept a training budget of my own, regardless of what job I'm at, because I know it's up to me to always uh, improve myself, you know? So I'm not the kind of person that's gonna say, oh yeah, I need, you know, during the pandemic, nobody was doing a lot of shopping and going into places anyway. But, uh, you know, my thing is, I like to go to Black Hat, right? And if my job's not gonna pay for me, I already got money for it, yeah. you know? I, um, so those are the things you have to have, have your own training budget because it's just like LeBron James, right? So they say LeBron, I don't know if it's true or not. They say he spends a million dollars on his body, yep, right? They do. Now, what's the other NBA player is doing? How much they're spending on themselves? So you have to take the time to spend on yourself, and you can't rely on others to take their money to spend on you. So you may be in a job that they don't have the money. So always take set aside some money. Some people, my friends, they, they'll take their income tax check. Once they get their refund, that's what they do. They take that to, for their own training or they invested in something. But the biggest investment is an investment in yourself. I hope everyone is taking this jewel that he's providing us. Um, understand when we talk about getting trained, companies do offer training, but a lot of times they don't offer the training that we desire. It may be something that is not in line with where we want to go, but it's in line with your current workflow. What he's saying is that you know, you should start setting aside X amount of dollars, you know, per paycheck, per month. However, you can set up your budget to have your own training budget and take your own growth and educational needs into your own personal hands. Am I correct, Arthur? That's right. You know, take some take the money, you know, and, and usually I've been doing a lot of I've been doing a lot of work with young people these days. And, you know, I'm trying to get them into the, the cybersecurity industry. And I, I tell them that, look. You don't have to have the cybersecurity is not a degree driven industry, right? Although you may go and see programs at different universities, get your master's in cybersecurity insurance and blah, blah, you know, all this stuff, but it's not a degree driven field. You know, um, I've told young individuals that you can find jobs. If you go to indeed.com, I love indeed because they lift salaries and you can just put high school diploma or GED, and you'll find jobs that will hire you 100,000 plus with a GED or a high school diploma in cybersecurity, as long as you know your stuff, right? It's not just anybody. If you have a felon, you can get a job in cybersecurity, depending upon what that felon is and how well you know your stuff. And more importantly, if you have a problem, that addiction, no matter what it is, you can still get a job because most tech companies, they don't do urine tests. Because in the back of their mind, they think this, look, if you want to create a new process or a new chip or whatever the case may be, design a new code, whatever it is, and you have to do a couple of lines of coke and molly and get drunk on the weekend, <laughs> be at it. You know, as long <laughs> as you produce so we can make billions off of your addiction because that feeds your creativity, go at it, right? right. Now, sad to say, you know, I, I don't believe in people using drugs and things of that nature, but... The, the, the barriers to get in are so low. If you are kind of that person that has an addiction, has a felon, you know, you, you didn't graduate high school or you may have graduated from high school. You know what? 
if you grind in cybersecurity, you'll get a job. Man, you know? I know I know so many people when I was younger that sold dope. They were geniuses, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yep. But happen to get in get involved in the wrong situation and mess up their life. And it's it's good to see that companies are um, looking at situations and with a with an open open mind to see okay. Did this person make a one-time mistake? Can they still come in and bring value? You know what I mean? Rather right. than just writing people off just because of a mistake they made in their teens or 20s or whatever. Right. And the key is also because when you're dealing with the underrepresented community in technology, right? Some of them have records. Some of them may yep. not have degrees. Some of us you know, may not speak the, the king's English, right? I've been working with individuals and they had such a strong accent that they just dealt with emails and instant messaging, but they still got a job. Mm -hmm. So the bears are so low if you know and understand what you're doing. So the key is to getting up to speed to be that person where when they look at you, they say, okay, I got to hire this guy. You know, right. um, I know we were, we were talking uh, offline initially, and I was saying I got my first job using Cisco technology and I never even touched the equipment. You know, and so it's like if I can do it and I'm, I don't think I'm the sharpest knife in the drawer, you know, but I knew that I needed to take time to figure out how to do it. Right. And what I would do, I would go to the library, I would go to Barnes and Nobles and Borders and I would just read different books on Cisco technology. It's all command line. So at the time yeah. I would just practice typing in notepad and I would draw my designs and my, my, my network design. Here's router one, here's router two, here's router three. They're all going to be OSPL for EIGRP. And then on my route of four, I'm going to do redistribution. I would just draw this stuff out and come up with what I thought the config would be. Because if it's all command line, it's basically just me. All I need to do is be in front of a terminal and type right. in config T interface zero zero slash zero. And I'm, I'm on it, you know, but I would spend like four or five hours a day doing that. Plus I was in school and I was working full time, you know, so there's, there is no excuse. You know, yeah. um, how, how bad you want it, how, how dedicated how bad you want it, you know, yeah. you, you got to go uh, black mamba on it, Kobe Bryant on it, you know, <laughs> and, and you got work ethic. And the Facts. thing that I find interesting about the IT field is that people like to hire and associate with people that are like mine, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I told another colleague that story and they did the same thing, you know, but it was a different technology. Uh, I found that out from a friend of mine who's from Zimbabwe, who's a programmer, and he was so good. And I asked him, well, how did you learn all these programming languages? And he said, well, look, my country, we don't have computers. We got books. I knew I'm going to be in front of a computer one day, so I read as much as I could to learn it. And that stuck in the back of my mind where I said, you know what? I'm going to do the exact same thing with Cisco. And it, it paid off. Man, you know, you know as, as people in general, we like to um, give ourselves excuses on why we can't give do something or we like to give ourselves um, a reason to put something off on why we can't start something that we want to learn or do something. So I love the fact that you didn't let nothing hold you back. You didn't put limitations on yourself on why you couldn't learn networking. Um, that's inspiring. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And like I said, my, my background is non-traditional. I, I got a friend of mine who used to be a forklift operator. Right. His resume reads forklift operator network engineer <laughs> my friends used to work with a guy that was a uh, senior SOC analyst his resume read grave digger senior security uh, operation analyst you know so it doesn't <laughs> matter what your your origin backstory is you know it's about how bad do you want it how much time you're going to put into perfecting your craft you Thanks. know I was in law school I wanted to be a lawyer yeah I wanted to be like Thurgood Marshall I spent my time watching Perry Mason and Matlock that's what I was going to do Oh, man, I was law clerking and I was transferring schools uh, in the midst of transferring schools. And the guys who were at a vote tech school was like, look, we're about to go to United Emirates and make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. All expenses paid. We're staying in the dorm. I was like, man, I want to do that. So I went to the same school and it was years ago and they had uh, Novell was big at the time with P console. So this dates myself. Right. Right. And then I heard about the CCIE test. And so at the time it was a two day test. And, you know, for those who don't know about the two day test, you will go in on one day, you have an entire day to build a network. And then the next day you st can still build the network until lunch. 
And at the lunch, the proctor would break your network and you had the five o'clock to fix it. And I heard, oh yeah, they make two, $2,000 a day and this and that. I'm like, you know what? I that's what I want to be. Right. So at a time in my life, that's what I studied for. That's the only thing I wanted to be. So I would put in four or five hours. They have not seen a router. There was no, you know, you couldn't uh, buy stuff off of uh, Google or, you know, packet tracing. None of that stuff was around GNS3. Right. Um, so you really had to either buy physical equipment, which was an arm and a leg because eBay wasn't really around. Right. And now you had to, you know, you just had to, to figure out a way to do it. You know, now the barriers are so low to get into Cisco because of, you know, packet tracer, GNS3, all this stuff that's out there. And now and it's easy to buy equipment, but years ago, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. You just had a real strong desire to, to do that. Yeah. I mean, outside of that, you know, you got Cisco DevNet that just has the entire, entire Cisco portfolio online for free. So yeah. you can just learn, you know, right on Cisco resources. I mean, there's no excuse on why you can't be successful in this industry. I mean, Outside of just the resources, the people that are sharing information and giving away time, you know what I mean? There, there's, there's no excuse. Right. And, and that's the beauty about the technology families that you'll find people, if they know that you're serious, they will um, share with you openly their, your, your, their knowledge to give to you. You know, yeah. I've been blessed. Like I said, I started off in law school, so I always felt that I had to play catch up. So I always had people that kind of helped mentored me. You know, uh, I didn't know anyone that actually knew Cisco, but uh, one of my first mentors was a guy that did Solaris. He was a Linux administrator, Solaris administrator as well. And I would just watch how he would work, how he interacted with people, how he troubleshoot, um, how he um, studied. Not only how he studied, but how he learned as well. Uh, another good friend of mine told me, you have to learn how to learn technology. That Fact. means you have to take an assessment of yourself and realize, okay, do you learn from reading? Do you learn from somebody telling you something? Do you learn from whatever method that you that you have? I'm the kind of person, I like to study different technology or subject every day because I'll get bored. Mm -hmm. You know, the next person may not be able to do that. They may have to say, you know, what? I need to read one book. If I'm going to do OSP for EIDRIP, or, you know, let me do that one week or one book the entire month. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I can do OSP one day. Let me do EIDRIP the next day. You know, I got to mix it up. Right. Uh, yeah. But that's my learning style. But it took me a while to learn that, you know, because I would get bored quick and I wouldn't want to study. So I had to figure that out about myself. So I had to be take a, a very um, accurate portfolio of me. And then yeah. what I did, I set a schedule. You know, my schedule is from 10 to 2, you know, because I'm a night out. I have others who, you know, friends in, in my, my, my sphere of influence, my friends, they're a morning person. So they wake up at 3 a.m. You know, I can't do that. You know, so you have to figure out when is the best time to learn for for you. And then if you have children, you got a wife, you got a spouse, significant other, you know, you got to be able to make time with them. So for me, the best time is when everyone's asleep, right. you know, and I just grind it out 10 to 2, 10 to 1 and uh, get my learning up, you know. Yeah. Now, do you do you learn best when you are learning a technology for work or for a certification or what? What? How do you learn best? Right. I think um, any any one of those work fine. What I do, we're talking about uh, user groups and stuff. So um, I started a, a security, a, a Cisco user group. And the reason why I started was because if you teach something, you have to learn it. Right. So I would start this user group sometime. Nobody show up. And this is in person before, you know, a pandemic or maybe one or two people. And that helped me learn something. So even if it was for a certification or my job, I'm still learning something. But I would gear the subject that I'm talking about for my job, right? So if I'm learning for certification, okay, well, we're going to talk about if I'm doing my CCIE and my my, my weak point is BGP, we're going to talk about BGP this week, you know? And if I don't get it, then we'll talk about BGP part two, then part three, you know? Uh, with my job now, or well, just everything's going towards the cloud anyway. So I kind of make sure that, well, look, everyone needs to learn about the cloud, including myself. So the best way for me to learn about the cloud is to host a user group. Sometimes other people present so I can learn from them. We do it twice a month. So now it forces me to learn. You know, that means I can't, when I'm 10 to 2, I can't binge watch Hawkeye or something. You know, I got to really study because 
in a week or so, I got to present on something, you know, and yeah. I don't want to be, you know, looking with my, you know, looking all silly and, and talking about stuff I don't know about, you know, so uh, that forces me if I'm trying to learn something for my job or learn something for certification to really do it. Uh, I don't really stress certifications now for myself personally, right? Uh, just because I have that the work history. Um, yeah. I took the CCIE, I didn't pass. And then I got a new job where it really didn't matter because we had so much technology. I was trying to learn the technology for my job. Yeah. right? Uh, and this was for a um, service provider. So I had all the toys, our own lab to play around with. I wanted to put the CCIE on the side because I wanted to concentrate to be that guy at the job. Yeah. Um, and then when I started being more security focused, I thought about the OSCP. And then I was like, you know what? For me to take the time to, to learn it, uh, I'd rather go in the ropes of trying to learn it. And then I found out about the OS, um, the export engineering one. And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, that'd be cool for me to do that because everyone's an OSCP. I don't find anyone that's an OSEE, you know? So right. let me go down that route. Uh, but I haven't taken or studied at it now because I just been trying to perfect my craft. Now I'm, I'm hunting in on the uh, OWASP top 10 in uh, cloud uh, red teaming and pen testing. So that's what I've been concentrating on. You mentioned something that I think is interesting that a lot of people may not realize. I know for myself, once I reached a certain level, certifications weren't as, like I think you mentioned it as well, as important. Um, because what I found to be way more important is one, um, the projects and the things that I've done in my work environment and the relationships that I've established indirectly and directly, you know, how you leave a workplace, how you interact in a workplace, your reputation like that right. speaks volumes for your career beyond just a certification. You know, you have to be able to say, here's what I did. Whether you led that team or were a part of that team, you have to be able to clearly effective your role and then the impact you had on that project, right? And the results of that project, you have to be able to effectively display that on your resume and in the interview. And then people are gonna Google you, they're gonna ask about you. And so if that doesn't align up with who you present yourself to be, that, that can really be detrimental to the results you're trying to get in a career path. What are your thoughts? I agree with you, you know, um, 100%, you know, being able to network and that relationship that you build, you know, your work ethic. Uh, my last three jobs that I've gotten was based upon relationships. You know, I'm at one job, one guy leaves and um, he goes to a new job and then automatically he's like, well, we need somebody. I, I used to work with this guy, Ota, and I know he's a good employee and I know I'm going to get their uh, referral bonus. So I'm going to go after him, <laughs> you know, and I started working there. And then the same thing, you work at a job for period of time and you, you know you don't want to leave because you establish your friendships you get that workflow then somebody hits you up say look man why don't you come work over here i work there and they'll tell you the experience this is how much they're paying and then you're like okay might as well and in the interview process it's just a matter of formality you yeah. know because they've already tried to they they already earmark and know that you're the person that you're going to be now the problem would be okay well how much they're paying you know and I know how sometimes when some people are looking for jobs, you know, they, they tell them, don't don't worry about the salary. You know, that works for some people. But right. with me, my first thing when you're dealing with these recruiters is say, look, this is how much money I want. And I give them a range. And I tell them, look, I only work for this. Now, I know somebody else who may work for that, but I don't work for that, you right. know. But and then it sets the tone as what kind of employee that you are, you know, yeah. because recruiters will lowball you. You know, I remember this was years ago. Asked some friends, they were real sharp, man, and um, they were checkpoint guys, and they were getting paid thirty five dollars an hour, which is mm. not bad, right? Yeah. And this was years ago, right? Same recruiter calls me up, offers me eighty five dollars an hour, and I was like, really? So I called <laughs> my guys up, man. They paying eighty five. How much they paying? You know? And so now, you know, shame on them for undercutting these guys, right? But we right. have to realize that as particularly in the security field, if you know your stuff, it's the honor for them to find you. You know, you have the the the, the ball is in your court. You know, they say, what, four million jobs unfulfilled or something like that. You know, 
so you have to use that to your advantage. I remember years ago, this is when I first started, you know, asking for six figures. I used to work with a guy and um, we were at a startup and they were laying people off. And he was he wasn't worried at all. Everybody else was like, man, you know, we live in paycheck to paycheck. We young and dumb. You know, it was like, man, this is this is the reality. You know, this dot com ministry. He was like, yeah, I'm not worried about it. You know, uh, he was a Solaris administrator. Right. And right. Solaris is probably not even around anymore. Um, <laughs> but he dealt with a certain product line called the Sun 10K. So back in the day, that was a super computing computer. Unix. Back in the day. It was Unix. like a Unix. It was like a million dollars yeah. computer. Right. So that was his thing. And he was like, oh, yeah, man, I don't, you know, I'll find some six figures. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I only work for six figures. <laughs> and I was like, man, why is that? He told me, he said that he used to work at a university. He spent an entire year, had no social life. All he did was Solaris Unix. Mm-hmm. You know, at a university, things are kind of slow paced. Right. But every time there was a troubleshooting ticket, he would try to solve it. If it was mm-hmm. something late night, he would do. He said, I didn't have a social life for an entire year. So I only worked for six figures. And I remember saying, man, I don't think I can do that. And he said, why? I didn't have an answer. And then he looked me dead in my eye and said, I don't even wear suits for an interview. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> Where they do that at? <laughs> you know? So I learned two things from that conversation. One, I need to work in a university to perfect my craft. <laughs> so I got a job at a university. I walked into the interview. There was another guy being interviewed at the same time. He had on khaki pants and a wrinkled shirt. <laughs> and I was like, wow, they do that here. <laughs> and he got the job. Oh, man. You both get the job, right? So that made me realize as long as you know your stuff, right? It, it yeah. doesn't matter, you know, what the, the, the problem may be. And think of it like this. When a guy told me about the Sun 10 case, a million dollar machine or whatever. How many people have that experience? So if you're a hiring manager and a lot of banks use it, right? And you have a project and your project, you, you know, you spend a million dollars for a machine or whatever it costs, your project is going to save the company, let's say $5 million. Hmm. There's not a lot of people that are Solaris administrators with the Sun 10 K because it's a supercomputer. You finally get three resumes on your desk. You call the first one and they're not interested. You call the second one, they're not interested. You call the third one, he comes into the interview with a Hawaiian shirt and some flip flops <laughs> on. What you gonna do? You got a $5 million project, you know, five million return on investment, you six months behind. This guy knows his stuff. Guess what? You gonna hire that guy. And he asked for 150, guess what? You gonna give him 150. You, you don't have a choice. You don't have I mean, a choice. You don't have a choice. Cause that hiring manager, whoever his CISO or senior manager is looking at him like, how come I can't get this done? And this is what the cybersecurity industry is now. They got so many open positions that they're looking at, okay, I got all these projects going. How can I get this stuff done? You know, if you're dealing with PCI compliance, you're not PCI compliant. You can charge monthly. And the hiring manager is saying, I can't find an employee. When the CISO is looking at you saying, man, you causing me a hundred grand a month in my company. You mm-hmm. need to find somebody. Well, we got this guy, you know, he just got out of prison, but you know, doing a uh, uh, phone freaking or something, but he wants 110. He didn't have any certs. Hey, hire him. Because who else are you going to get? Right? So the ball is in our court. Okay. Let's, 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 let's take this back for a minute. When, when you talk about the um, Sun 10K skills, right? right? That was a rare skill. Right. In cybersecurity, what is that rare skill that will set you apart? from everyone else or does it not really matter that, that's a good question so and i'm pretty sure if you ask the next person they may have something different but this is what i think in cybersecurity or in technology that will set you apart from everybody else and when you think about technology even cybersecurity, there's so many stereotypes right but most of those stereotypes are true most it people can't talk they can't read or they can read, but you know, they don't want to technical writing. They don't want to document stuff. Right. So my thing is the little things that set you apart is those soft skills, Hmm. right? If you have the soft skills to go in and present to a company or talk in an interview in an intelligent way to convey whatever's in your mind, even if you troubleshoot the network is down, you can say, okay, this is what's happening. I know how to give you updates and I can solve the problem, but more importantly, I can convey 
to senior leadership, this is what's happening. Right. That goes a long way because most people can't do that. You know, you may be sharp and everything, but a lot of people can't talk in the IT industry. Right. Mm. So part of number two, having a user group and presenting and doing conferences is that you get that gift to gap. You'll be able to present. So now when people are saying, well, how much you want to get paid? You can articulate that. Not only that, but when you in that interview, I always say there's a $30,000 answer and then there's a $10,000 answer. The $10,000 answer is, uh, is the light on? Did you, did you turn it on and turn it off? <laughs> you know, the $30,000 answer is, okay, let me see if the three-way handshake has been established. Is there a same, you know, that's a little bit more in detail. So when you're in that interview and someone's asking you uh, about troubleshooting the question, that is when you got you to gotta go broke. That's when all that work, those four hours of training that you've been putting in in the gym, you know, you're studying that's when you go for broke to say, look, this is I'm capable of and I can speak it. So now you know it. Right. You know, I got another friend, what he does when he's in when he's in a uh, interview situation, he opens up his lab. He's like, OK, let's this is what I know. And he'll go through his lab and explain everything in it, mm -hmm. you know, and now the people who are looking at him say, OK, he knows his stuff because he has his lab. He labs it out. Now, he has a lot of physical equipment, you know. Uh, everyone, it may not be, depending upon what you want to do, that may not be the route. You know, you got your electric bill and everything, and all those some stuff may be virtual. You have to figure out, one, how to laugh the stuff out, how to talk to it. You know, you got to practice. You know, you got to get your Allen Iverson on and practice anyway, right? <laughs> so in the midst of doing that, you have to be able to talk and explain what you're doing. And yeah. people will be more impressed by that to be able to explain to them as well as you, as long as you know your stuff. That's what's up. I'm going to pause right here. Look, we hit the ground running in this interview. Normally, what I do is I do shout outs to the chat moderators and see where everybody located. So we're going to pause right here. Let everybody digest everything that you said and the knowledge that you dropped. I want to do some shout outs to everybody that's tuning in. Thank you all for joining us today. We are here. We are here with Otha Mayberry, May Mayberry who is a cybersecurity architect, technology instructor, a mentor, a public speaker, a YouTuber. I'll put his YouTube channel in the in the chat. Make sure y'all go check that out. The type of knowledge that he drops, he's thorough, professional, and he takes his time and really gives you the meat and potatoes that you need for the information that he shares. Now, what I want to do is say shout out to everyone that's tuning in. What up, Sam Jones, Tania, Tiffany? Thank you all for moderating. My guy Gabe, I see you. Let's see who else is moderating. Kev Tech, I see you, family. Keep it techy. Thank you all for tuning in. Now, one more shout out. Where where are you all located? Let me see. Put your air code in the chat, and I'll do some shout outs real quick, and we'll get back to this interview. Also, share this out on your social media content um, platforms and like this video and all that good stuff. 919 in the building, 516-302, Newark, New Jersey, Austin, Texas, Tacoma. All right, I, I like y'all area codes. Y'all giving me the locations. Caribbean, 908-910-816 in the building. I see you, KC, 973-973. What is that, Dayton? 347-205-347-9. 1 0 New Zealand. Look at that 240 317 737. Hey, I thank everybody for you know tuning in today, wherever you are in the country around the world. We thank you all for joining us. Now, I want to take some time to get back to this interview. When we talk about getting into cybersecurity, Otha, you mentioned in one of your videos there's a traditional traditional route and a non-traditional route can you kind of break those down right so i i think that the traditional route would be you know you go to school and you get a degree computer science or information technology or whatever the case may be um you get a master's or something get a certificate and then that's their traditional route right it, it's the traditional educational uh, model that we've been taught since we were little okay the more non-traditional route would be similar to what I'll call the, the I don't want to say that they're bad guys, the hackers and things of that nature, but they do a non-traditional route. You know, they're not trying to go to school for four, four years or five years and they come out with uh, 
student loans, right? What they do, they just go get the training, mm. right? They have carding universities. They have the, the, the fraud Bible. I mean, you can get that information quickly, right? Um, at these carding universities, you get in, you know how you go to a SANS train or any train, you get a virtual environment, right? At some of the carding universities, you go and they give you an actual company. That's what you're hacking. Mm. You know, there is no... CD cloud environment is an actual environment, some corporation, right? And then after you finish, they give you a job with some criminal organization of, of your choice, right? So they got a good job placement. So the non-traditional route would be just getting that, that, that information, getting the knowledge, right? So if you want to do um, export development, right? You can, you know, you can go to university and get a class and things of that nature, but there are a lot of people who teach that at the, from Sands to Black Hat. Um, there's another guy named, uh, it escapes me, Corling Team, the guy, Peter, out of, uh, I think is uh, Austria. Um, they have classes for uh, expo development, right? So there's always these classes. There's always people who've been in the industry and you all, all you have to do is take the time to learn from them. Right. And you can find them at conferences, uh, all throughout the world. Uh, and you just have to take the time to to find these individuals, hmm. you know, and what you do, you kind of map out what you want to learn. So one of the things that I wanted to learn was shell coding, right? I wanted to learn assembly. And that was a hard thing to run, learn because now back in the day, people used to teach assembly, right? But I actually went to a class at Black Hat and um, the guy was, it was, it was called the shell coding lab. And that helped me out to really give me a good understanding of trying to figure out shell coding assembly and the whole nine yard, right? Mm -hmm. And now since I've had that class, I have to build upon that foundation, right? To 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 to, to grow from that. So I, I think that's a non-traditional path. And with that non-traditional path, as long as you can show that you know the material, a company will hire you. So how and then it gets to the point, well, how do you show that you know a given material? I got a friend of mine, I, I you know. I don't like to use the word that I was his mentor because we were friends, right? And he was actually older than me. But his background was engineering, more of on building engineering, you know, structural type stuff, but not in cybersecurity. He had his first cybersecurity interview and it was with a bank. And the guy was, I'm going to paraphrase what the interview looked like. Blah, 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 no experience. Blah, 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 no experience. Good work ethic, but no experience. And then, you know, the, the guy told him, well, you know, did you know that you have cross-site scripting on your banking portal since 2012? Mm -hmm. And not only that, did you know, Mr. Interviewee, interviewer, that your, on your password and username for your email address is out there on the dark web, and this is what I think it is. You know, he didn't tell him what it is, right? And also, you have so many machines, because he went to Shodan, and found you know the environment and start talking about the different machines and stuff that are publicly accessible. And you know what he told them? Oh yeah, you're hired. <laughs> you know, so the whole conversation shifted, right? But it's all based upon this guy no cybersecurity experience whatsoever. He had about maybe uh, I, I taught a class in uh, in a part in Inglewood uh, at Urban Tech Academy for like six weeks, and it was like my first adult class, right? And, and the class was kind of horrible because we didn't have the equipment that we could have. So we redid it again for another six weeks. So he had only 12 weeks, right? But he got a job. <laughs> you know, he's been doing that job for about two years now. That's you know, cool. And so uh, no certification, older gentleman, you know, so he's kind of, you know, work reentry, continuing education, whatever you call it. But his thing was, look, I know my stuff. And his thing, the underline was, look, if you're working with a team and they didn't tell you this stuff and I'm straight off the street and told you this stuff, I'm a force to be reckoned with. Hire me. Yeah. And get hired. And then the other <laughs> thing was, well, if you don't hire me, what am I going to do with this information? You know? So, but that just shows you how not only desperate, and I hate to use the word desperate, how the industry is, but it just shows how they need people that are passionate about what they're doing. And this guy was passionate about what he was doing. He would study two and three hours a day, right? And then although he had 12 weeks of formal training, right? Um, but he would constantly call me all the time. What about this? What about this? Have you thought about this? Help me out with this. So we would go over scenarios, right? Right. Um, but he was passionate about that. 
I think it's cold that he can walk into an interview, you know, kind of go through the interview and not not be able to answer any questions and then recover, you know, to say, you know what? I may not have any experience in this, but here are the things that I do know about your company that you may not know and still get a job from that. That's cold. That's, yeah. yeah. And, and I think people realize that because going back to stereotypes, technical people know that technical people may not have that gift to gap yeah. and that they may not do well in the interview. So if you have any interview and things are not going well, they're going to always say, do you have any questions for us? And people can tell you how smart you are how intelligent you are about based upon the questions, right? Mm -hmm. So if you bomb the interview and there's senior guys in the room and you thought that he was being an ass towards you, guess what? When it's time to ask questions, that's when you hit him, you know? That's and then deep. you can hit him with as many questions as, as possible. And then the manager that's in the room or the other leads in the room will say, you know what? This guy does know him stuff. He just wasn't good as in being interviewed because most technical people aren't. But we know he knows his stuff based upon the type of questions that he asked. You know, mm -hmm. so always if things not going great, that end of the uh, interview would ask you, do you have any questions for us? Just go broke. You know, what are you going to lose? You, you know, if, if you think you bombed the interview, not going to get hired anyway, you might as well just, you know, go for broke. For sure. For sure. Um, I'm going to take a couple questions from the chat real quick. Shout out to my guy, um, Master IT, for the super chat. Salute. Lab every day. Appreciate you, family. Um. Let's see the first question I want to get to. All right, here's a question from Gary McNeely. This question says, is cybersecurity the same and looking at vulnerabilities and stick on a server? Repeat that again. Cybersecurity the same as finding I guess vulnerabilities looking at on a server? Yeah, as looking at vulnerabilities and stick on a server. So the thing about cybersecurity is that it's, and that's an excellent question. It's such a broad topic or, or, or topic where you can have a person who says, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a cybersecurity engineer. And they do look at vulnerabilities on a server, or you can have a person who does a vulnerability engineer or vulnerability management, right? Uh, I saw a job description for vulnerability manager where you need to learn Qualys, you need to know uh, Nessus to find vulnerabilities that were on servers or, you know, phones or any uh, um, endpoint device. So it could be that cybersecurity could also be, um, what do you call it? A QSA auditor, the auditor for PCI environments. That's part of cybersecurity. In addition to cybersecurity, you need somebody to write the um, security policy for organization, right? So that's part of cybersecurity. Now, some people may call that, you know, information security, um, security policy, risk and compliance, whatever the case may be, but it still falls underneath that umbrella of cybersecurity. Okay. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. All right. Here's a question from Sam Jones. He said, what is your role at your current job and where did you start on your cybersecurity path? So I started on my cybersecurity path um, a very long time ago. So I was always interested in cybersecurity. And so when I, when I told the story that I used to work at a university, uh, I installed Snort on a, a Linux machine, and that was my first IPS that I would deploy. Now, at this university, they didn't have a firewall. So every semester when people will come to the campus, uh, we will have all these viruses and worms and things of that nature. So what I would do, I learned how to use this, the um, security in my Cisco switches. Right. And that will help out to a degree. And then I finally convinced the higher ups to get a firewall. Right. Uh, so that was my my first entry point, you know, playing around with uh, Snort, um, running in map in my internal environment just to see what's happening. You know, uh, and it was at a university. Nobody, you know, nobody was logging stuff. And if they were, you know, who was really looking at the logs. Right. right. So I would just kind of learn things in that university setting. And then as I grew, you know, my experience was with firewalls. You know, it was like setting up firewalls and things of that nature and IPSs and IDSs, right? So that was my, my thing. And then still using the, the Cisco switches and routers, their security um, features that were bundled in those particular products, right? But then I got to the point where I wanted to be very serious with security. 
You know, I want to be that guy that you see on TV that's just sitting in a chair, you know, that eating hot pockets in his mom's basement. I want to be that guy. So right. how do you get to that point? So I was already hosting a user group for Cisco. So I said, you know, we're going to start doing security. And everybody else was like, yeah, that's fine. Let's do security. And what we would do would just sit around and watch videos, right, of people doing cybersecurity. And then it got to the point where I was like, you know what? This doesn't do it for me because I really want to learn this stuff. So I'm going to learn it on my own and then I'm going to teach it, right. you know? So what I would do, I will learn stuff and then I will present and teach at the user group. And then I started getting deeper into my security skill set. And then I would go listen to other people present. Then I started going to uh, SANS training, black, you know, and then later on I started going to Black Hat. But I would just, anywhere I could that somebody that was in cybersecurity, I would, I would try to learn as much as possible, but then I would teach stuff, you know, when it was backtrack four, when it was backtrack three, when I first started really doing cybersecurity, I would learn how to use Metasploit, how to use all the stuff in backtrack three, then backtrack four, then five, then Kali Linux, you know, and then I just kept going. I was already strong in Linux, so I didn't have a problem with that, but then people that wanted to do security would have problems with Linux. So then we started teaching Linux. So I would teach Cisco, teach security and Linux, you know? And so it, I just kind of grew from there. And then um, at my current job, well, before I get to my current job, I'll always do just the firewalls, routers and switches, firewalls, routers and switches. And then it got to the point at my current job, um, they had a positioning for someone to do specialized in cybersecurity, you know? And uh, I presented at a conference and uh, I did pretty good presenting. The guy was like, yeah, I want him on my team. And he didn't tell me that, but he told my manager, I'm going to hire that guy, you know? And then I just do strictly cybersecurity now, you know? So I started back, you know, really going strong when Backtrack 3 and 4 was out probably with 2005, 2000. Wow. Yeah, so whenever that was. So that's when I really started going at it, you know, to this day. So I just try to keep up my skill set. Uh, and there's a lot more people that are smarter than me. And I love to gravitate toward those individuals because that's how I learn. Yeah, you know, uh, so I don't sure. mind being, I'm not gonna say the dumbest one in the room, but that's, you know, I don't mind not being the smartest person in the room so I can learn from every individual. Facts, facts. Uh, I definitely make that a habit to not be the smartest person in the room. Yeah. Um, now I may act like I'm the smartest person in the room, but I know I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here, here's a question I have when we talk about um, developing your skills how should you develop your skills for cybersecurity? you know like you say lab every day right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is no way you can you know you, you can't get around it you know uh, now one thing that I do that's interesting that a lot of people have told me they, they've done the same thing is that I would go to Indeed even now and what I'll do, I'll put in like Cisco or I'll yep. put in, say, for example, OWASP top 10 or uh, let's say cloud security, AWS. And what I'll do, I'll look at all the job descriptions for cloud, cloud security, AWS, Cisco, right? Those are my keywords. And anything that comes up for those job roles, like they may say, okay, you need to know Ansible. You need to know Chef. You need to know um, uh, Serracata. You need to know security. You know, I'll, then I'll figure out, okay, I'm looking at five job descriptions. They all say three, you know, they, they have a common denominator of what to learn, but then there's these five or four things that each one's talking about that I don't even know what they are. Then that's what I need to hone in on. I'm not looking for a job, but I'm looking for what the industry is looking for to say, okay, I need to add on to this, to, to my skill set. Right. You know, so if they're looking for Ansible and Shelf and I'm trying to do Cisco in the cloud, guess what? I need to learn that stuff, you know, because evidently it has some sort of play with that, you know, that I may not know what it is currently because it's new to me, but I had to put it to say, I need to learn Ansible, I need to learn Chef, I need to learn APIs, all this other stuff that I see in these job descriptions because that's gonna keep me relevant in my current job. Right, right. I, I, lo I love that and I do the same thing, especially when I was back in network engineer, I would look at, look at all the top companies in my area, look at the job description, like you said. All right, so they're saying all these companies have ACI, SD WAN, Python. So those right. are the, like the top three skills I need to learn now in order to be at the top of you know the competition in my area. You know. Yeah. 
and that's how you 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 keep your skill set. And then the thing I like about Indeed is that because you can look on salary, you can see your value for learning specific technologies. Because back in the day, there was no, you know, you couldn't find a salary. Some people were posted, but if you remember searching for jobs five, six, ten years ago, that was difficult to do, you know, yeah. because you didn't know what salary asked for. And if you ask for under, the company's not going to tell you that. Oh, they're just going to pay you. If you only want fifty thousand, sure, we're just going to offer you a hundred. You know, so hey. you don't know back then, but now you have a better idea of what the industry is looking for based upon salary. You know, look. If, if you could, if you're a network engineer right now and you're really good at networking and you know network automation you can basically write your ticket you know there's been numerous times to where i'm talking to recruiters and they're asking me my number repeatedly right. and we'll keep going higher you know what i mean right. like and i know for you being in cyber security there's certain skills that you can learn that will set you apart because not too many people know it. Is there any anything, any area particular or any skill set like that in cybersecurity? You know, th there are, you know, and I know we talked about the soft skill stuff, but what I find that dealing with that exploit development, you know, that malware analysis, that security research, you know, those guys are hard to find, you know, uh, and that's something that you, you can go to college and probably take a couple of courses and stuff, but you have to be passionate about that stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I took a five day class and this stuff was over my head. And, and, but I had a good group of guys that we would study after the class, you know, and, um, I was talking to an instructor, excuse me. And he said it took him three years to learn this stuff, hmm. you know? <clears throat> so, you got to be patient, right? You know, perfect your craft. It's not going to come overnight. You know, give yourself maybe six month goals or maybe three months, every three months, reevaluate yourself. And then six months, reevaluate yourself. Right. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm X used to have this thing. You grow as fast as you want to grow. Right. <clears throat> so, you know, if you half as in it, you know, spending 20 minutes a day, you watching dancing with the stars and binge watching Netflix, you may not get that job that you want, but yeah. if you're serious about it, you spend three, two, three hours a night, you're good. You're going to set your own salary. And, and sad to say, even if you do half ass it, you probably still make six figures because there's not, that many, you know, they, they want you that bad, you know? Hey, one of the things that you mentioned, and I don't know if people caught it, but the ex to really get exponential growth is, is like two things that I found to get exponential growth. The first thing that you do is, you teach it. Whatever you're trying to learn, you teach it. Now, you may not teach it great the first time you teach it, but you'll get feedback. Like, teach something to your kids if you got kids. Yep. They're going to ask why, and they're going to ask questions. And every time they ask why, you're going to have to think deeper about the thing you're trying to explain. That That's what I found. Right. And, and you make a good point because in, in technology, there's not a lot of good instructors. Right. You know, and it's not because they don't have the passion or the, the willingness. It's just hard to teach technology. It's hard to teach period. Yeah. Right. And when you think about the stuff that we look at and learn, I mean, it is boring material. Yeah. You know, how do you take something boring and make it fun? That's very difficult to do. It's easy to do it in the classroom setting in person, but imagine trying to do that now virtual, you know, it's very difficult because you can't read the body language of your students to see if they understand the material. Right. right. When you're in a classroom, you can see if they're frowning up, but you can see if they're dozing off or wondering to, to, to reinvent that uh, whatever the material you were doing. And then one thing that I realized about teaching is that, you know, you can't really spend an hour teaching. You got to break it up in chunks and segments. Yeah. So when I was really teaching Cisco, um, I, what I would do, we would go over a concept and then we would do it. You know, let's just lab it out. Yeah. And then we will talk as we go through it. Right. Yeah. And then we'll teach again. We we'll, we'll keep building upon this stuff. And then, although my tests were multiple choice, supposed to be from a curriculum perspective, we did everything hands on, you know, because if you go into a university and you want to learn how to build routers, that's what you should be tested on building routers. Right. So I'll take the time to go through all your router configurations to make sure you get it right. 
Right. You know, but it's going to be the hands on. And when you finish this class, you're going to know subnetting and you're going to learn OSPF, EIGRIP, and redistribution and how to set this stuff up. Yeah. You know? So, you know, that teaching it is vital. And then learning how to teach, if you can convey it pretty good, then um, you can talk your way to any job, you know, any salary. True story. The the second thing that I found that helped me grow exponentially is surrounding myself with people that are smarter than me and will challenge me. You know how you're around some smart people and they will give you the answer, but some people will are extremely smart. They won't give you the answer, but they'll point you in the right direction and challenge you to go deeper into your thought. Like being around people like that have helped me grow like so much in my career. Right. And I got about four, four or five guys that, you know, we in this group text and, you know, we'll text each other and things of that nature. And, um, you know, that's my, my sounding board. You know, when they, when they're talking about something, I'm like, man, you're talking about that. I didn't even know what that is. Let me, right. I got to learn on that now, you know, or yeah. sometimes they have their own user group. So I'm like, I got to make sure I'm in that particular user group so I can learn on that session, learn what it is. And so those are the things that, that push you to, to make you better. And you need those people in your life, you know? Yeah. And even with me sometimes when, when I was young in my career, when I would call and ask a question to, to one of my mentors, they were like, man, did you look it up first? <laughs> you know? And I got to be like, no, nah, I didn't. Well, you look it up and if you can't find it, then I'll look it up for you. Cause evidently your Google is different than mine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but those things, you know, help, help you get straight, you know? Yeah. Some of my guys used to have these contests where we it was like learn Python, right? And we gave ourselves 30 days. It was like a 30 day challenge. And you learn Python after 30 days, we're gonna figure out who can write the best Python program. Mm. But we all had to put money in the pot, right. you know? And right. so it was like, okay, in 30 days, who's gonna get the pot? Yeah. You know, and so we'll text each other what you're working on. But those little things help, you know? We did one for CCNA, you know? And, and there's one guy who took up the challenge you know, he started uh, doing voice over. Um, uh, he was a voice engineer, telephony. You know, he did a CCNA, but he gravitated towards voice. So those things help. And, and having someone to challenge you consistently uh, will make you a consistent, better person. Facts. You know? Facts. Facts. That That's what it's all about. You know, and I admire you for that because you bring other people with you into your user groups and, you know, motivate other people to be great. So salute. Right. Salute. Man, um, we've covered a lot today. A lot today. I'm going to go back to this cybersecurity um, okay. questions. You made a video about how to make 100K with GED in cybersecurity. Is 100K the floor in cybersecurity? A lot of people make it seem like it is. Is it? No. You know, I got to saying everybody should be three jobs away from making $150,000. So... To me, you know, um, I had a friend in interview, the entry level cybersecurity, they were paying like 85,000, you know, oh no, it was 95, right? That's entry level. So imagine what mid senior, you know, what they would charge. So that person makes 95 entry level. After a year, how much should they be making? When they go to the new job, they should be probably making 125 or 120, right? After they work that job, they should be right after 150, you know? And then if you start doing stuff like a uh, sales engineer, right? Then not only do you have a base salary, but you get commissions and bonuses as well. Right. You know, so you have to figure out, you know, what what you want to do, you know, because like I said, that cybersecurity is the umbrella. They have so many things underneath it, right? But um, you should at least be making, I'll say, three jobs away from 150. And if you're not making 150, you should be making 130 at least, you know, um, and then grow, go on from there. Because remember, it's not enough people, you mm. know. I got a, I got a friend of mine who does mainframe stuff, you know, and uh, he retired. He was making 100,000 plus whatever doing mainframe. When he retired on a Friday, Monday, he started a new job <laughs> doing mainframe. <laughs> Because you can't find people to do mainframe. And, you know, <laughs> I thought mainframe is about Y2K, right? But people nope. still have it, yeah. right? And, and where are you learning how to do mainframes at? They're not teaching that in school. 
right. think IBM has a program for it. But so imagine how much can you make doing mainframes? Yeah. You know, oh, I want 50,000. No, you know, because who's doing this stuff? I want right. 60. No, I'm like, man, if I'm doing mainframes, you're going to pay me 150, you know, yeah. and then give me a $50,000 signing bonus or something, <laughs> you know, something ridiculous because it's not a lot of people doing it. So when you find an area where people aren't doing a lot of stuff, then you have to realize this is your, this could be your bread and butter. Hmm. You know, this is what 2021, this is my friend's still doing mainframe and he's getting paid very well because you're doing virtualization. I didn't know they were doing stuff on mainframes because I'm not that mainframe guy, right? Right, right. And it's just my ignorance of it. But, you know, he's pulling my coattail on that stuff. You know, uh, there's a guy, his bread and butter doing security on mainframes. You know, I can't think of his name, but, you know, he's the only one. Because you, if you go to Black Hat, you go to security conference, you're going you're gonna to find people talk about, oh, Metasploit this and intro to security and this and that. But there's only one person I've ever seen talk cybersecurity on mainframe. This is one guy, you know. Mm. So you can imagine his class is always going to be packed, you know, because right. it's a lost art. Right. That That's deep. It, that That's really deep. Um Another thing that you mentioned was the Black Hat Conference. You recommend cybersecurity professionals go to that? So, and, and I, don't, I don't get any money from Black Hat or anything of that nature. But the thing about Black Hat is that when you think of conferences, you have SANS. And SANS is very good. But SANS is very expensive, right? right? Now, they have a certificate program where you can, it's a little bit cheaper than the actual class. Then they have the work-study program, which helps out. But I find that Black Hat is more affordable, mm. you know, for, for me. And sometimes I, I need to learn in that structured format. Right. Now, I've never been to DEF CON because usually Black Hat is right after DEF CON. And, you know, I got family and stuff, so I wouldn't spend all the time in Vegas. And then my company, we actually have a conference in um, Vegas as well. So that'd be too long for me to go from Black Hat to DEF CON. And then my own job, you know, that's too long. So I just strict with the black cat. I don't go to the workshops. I just deal with the training because it's affordable and they usually have something that I like. Mm -hmm. Another company is um, Black Hills Information Security, right. Wild, West, Wild West Hacking Fest. Very good training and it's affordable, you know? And like I said, I don't get anything from those guys as well, but these are the trainings that I do and I know they're affordable. There's another guy, um, Pentest Academy, very affordable training and real good as well. And these are the training that I use because it's affordable and they're good. All right, I'm going to put these in the chat real quick. Hold on. So this is Black Hat dropping that in the chat. Another one is Black Hills Wild Wild West. The Wild Wild West Hacking Fest. You know, and it's probably a, a ton, tons more. Um, the Cyber Mentor on you, on YouTube, um, he has a Udemy stuff. Heath Adams, he's really good. Yeah. Um, Hacker Sploit is real good, as well. Um, yeah, those are the ones top of mind that I that I can think of. All right, put this up there. And so I got the Black Hat, I got the Wild Wild West. Um, Hacking Fest. It was one more you said? Uh, Pen Tester Academy. Pen Tester Academy. All right. And then uh, INE is good as well. Um, really? INE? I haven't, yeah. I, I, I haven't done, um, I haven't used them in a while, but I know they have uh, pretty good material from a Cisco perspective. But oh, yeah. they brought in their, um, their library now, the catalog of courses to do cybersecurity and cloud and everything and um like i said i've had their all access pass in the in in the in the, in the past before you know gotcha, and these are gotcha. affordable you know because when you think about it i mean some of this training is, is, is pretty expensive right so you want to get stuff that's affordable that's cheap but good and these guys are pretty pretty good all all the ones that i mentioned uh, before thanks man thank you and if it's any Shout out to Gay for calling me out for posting the links myself. My moderators, <laughs> thank y'all for your hard work. If there's anything that I missed, could you all please post it in the chat? I appreciate it. <laughs> I'll be hands on trying to multitask all the time. Right. Yeah. Hey, um, <clears throat> Arthur. Now, 
for those of the audience that may not know who you are, can you talk about your user group, your YouTube platform, and just kind of give everybody an overview? Right. So um, my, my first user group, I started with BDPA, which is the Black Data Processing Association, right? So we started a user group dealing with Cisco, um, and then we started broadening with different topics, cloud, uh, containers, and Linux, right? Um, and then that grew into the point where I started working with the youth with Urban Tech Academy in Chicago and Inglewood with uh, Patrick Zaki Young. So I started doing with that and we just kind of combined those user groups. In the process of that, um, I started what we call the Chicago Cisco Security User Group. And so uh, I have that user group. And then when I moved to Tennessee, I started the Tennessee Security User Group, right? Now that's a lot of user groups, but it's just different titles. They all use the same links to, to, to log in and the whole nine yards, right? Um, so I'll, I'll send you the links that you can share with the individuals. And in the user groups, we don't want it to be the oath of show. You know, I want it where everyone else can get a chance and opportunity to present. And as they present, you know, we're not going to boo them and, and heckle them and things of that nature, but we're giving individuals the opportunity to perfect their craft. And when people do ask you questions, it's not to, to, to trip you up. They're asking you questions because they really don't know. And if you don't know the answer, all you have to do is say, I don't know. I didn't research it. You know, so I think part of that, when we were talking about the skill set, being able to present is key because when you're in that interview, you're basically presenting and you're basically trying to get your, your, your verbiage flow on so you can stand out, so you can answer that question in a deep dive technical way where you can stand out from everyone else, you know? So I think user groups are important. If you didn't even go to my user group, you can go to somebody else's user group, but get the opportunity to present. And you may be nervous about presenting at a conference. So you have the opportunity to present with us. Now, what I will do is this, after you present, I will edit it down. So, because just in case you're not flowing right, I edit all that stuff out. So we edit it out, we put it on YouTube, we put a little intro on it. So now you can use that for your own brand and material as well. You know, so um, that way you present, you get the you get the experience presenting. And then when you put on your resume or, or, or whatever, you have the opportunity to say, okay, this is me presenting on a particular subject matter. So um, that's the beauty of it. Ah, oh, man, you just touched. I was about to let you go, but you just touched on something else that... I think is important. You mentioned branding. Um, when you, when people do presentations in their user groups and you post it on YouTube, it has their name. So when people Google, Google them and it'll help them come up. How important is that when it comes to um, uh, personal brand in tech? You know, I think it goes a very long way because everybody's going to Google you anyway, right? So you have to kind of leverage what you what you find. And uh, i tell you a, a quick story. So I moved from Chicago to Tennessee and I'm pairing up with an account manager and I'm his engineer. And they didn't tell him that he was getting somebody new. He knew he was getting somebody new, but they didn't, he wasn't in the interviewing process, you know, because he's an account manager. He wants to make sure his engineer, you know, personality will, will jail, right? So I call him up just to let him know, look, you know, to, to establish a relationship with them once I found out I was moving to Tennessee and I never forget, I picked him I, when I called him and I, he said, who is this? I told him who I was. He started laughing. He said, man, I'm looking at you on YouTube right now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it clearly broke the ice. And it was like a presentation I did like in 2019, you know? And so having that brand helps you out because now people can see you and see what you can do, right? right. Even before the interview or even before the interaction, and that makes them feel comfortable about you because yeah. usually when I'm interviewing somebody, I may look at their resume, but I don't really ask them that much about their resume. I'm asking them stuff about the job they're going to get into. Right. They may not know anything about that job, but I just want to see how they handle this stuff, you know, because if they're sharp and most people are, then they can learn this stuff. So it's just basically trying to figure out, okay, is this going to be the guy when I call him at 2 a.m. in the morning? And ask him and say, I'm stuck troubleshooting something. He said, well, is the lights on? Is it flickering? <laughs> I don't need that guy. I need right. the guy to come up with some good answers. And for him to realize I've already checked to make sure the thing is on. <laughs> you know, yeah. the lights are flickering. 
So um, that's the power of, you know, having that flow, you know, yeah. to be able to do that, you know. Understood that. Um, so what, what platforms would be good for this when it comes to um, putting out your personal brands? YouTube, LinkedIn, what are your thoughts? So I just use YouTube uh, for for uh, my videos. I have a Twitter, but I don't, I don't, I rarely use it. I do use my Twitter to follow people because it seems a lot of people in the um, InfoSec community use Twitter to right. post out new stuff. So I do use that, but I don't use it for my branding. Use it for me, I use LinkedIn and I use YouTube. So I may put something on YouTube and then I'll send it out, my link out on um, um, LinkedIn or sometimes Facebook, but usually it's just YouTube because when they, when they Google me, they'll, they'll find me. Yeah, or, or a version of you. <laughs> yeah, the, a, a version of me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that, man. Hey, th- this has been a really good interview. Um, I think we touched on a lot of the questions that I had personally uh, okay. from my research. We got some from the chat, and you've been getting a lot of love in the chat as well. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us today, and you know I want to do this again. I do. Yeah, definitely. Let me know when. I'm, I'm all ears, all eyes. I'm available for you. For sure, for sure. Um, shout out to everyone that's joined us tonight. If you have not already liked this video, please do. We're going to take about two or three more questions. So if you have a question, drop it in the chat in the next couple minutes and we'll answer it. Here's, here's a question from AO Bro. He says, what's an idea cybersecurity entry level role with little to no experience with one or two certs? So um, I would say anything dealing with uh, SOC analysts or even threat hunting, things of that nature. I'm a big person on OSINT and OSINT is open source intelligence, right? Hmm. So that's basically, I'm going to the internet and I'm looking at companies using Shodan or uh, using openbugbounty.org, or have I been pawned, right? Doing those things because when you're about to hack somebody, an organization, the information gathering is key because you have to have enough information to be able to hack somebody, right? Mm. So OSIN is real big. So I was getting my start doing that, you know, how to find out information about a particular company, how to find the pain points, how do you show them, how to use have I been pawned? And what you could do is this. You can use all that OSIN information, patch it up, and do it for do it on a nonprofit, you know, and then send that information to the nonprofit. And then do another one and another one, right? And then on your resume, you can put OSIN threat researcher, Intel mm-hmm. risk researcher, right? And you have the experience, you just didn't get paid for it. You know, and sometimes people are um afraid to work for free, but I used to law clerk and I didn't get paid. The guy used to give me lunch and that was it, you know, but I wanted the experience, you know, so I didn't mind doing that. And so sometimes you may have to, to work, not get paid physically with money, but you're getting paid with that experience, right. you know, and once you can put that direct research on it, then you can get a job, you know, but on your resume, at least you'll have something that you've done for six months or a year. You, I, I'm doing this for nonprofits, you know, and what's the organization going to say? Zeiss, thank you. You know, right. they'll they'll welcome that information. Yeah, I think I think that's some good advice because a lot of times nonprofits have, you know, VPs that have, you know, high positions in cities or something. Right. They can write you a letter of recommendation, you know, yeah. or you can have them write a, your letter of recommendation on your LinkedIn wall. You know, that's like right. that, that stuff holds weight. Yeah. And nonprofits have boards. Right. And like you said, those people on the boards, they work for companies and they'll be like, you know, I got this report and you learn how to put stuff in PowerPoint or presentation form or word or whatever, that technical documentation that a lot of people don't like to do. And you just pass it out right to, to the board. Yep. And they'll be like, oh, this is real, well documented. He must know his stuff, you know, put some pictures on there because executives like pictures. <laughs> and then, you know, that is your portfolio of work. That's your body of work. You go on to the next company, yeah. You know, and if you get good enough, you can start charging them. You know, you may not charge them a lot, but you start charging them a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, 
Here's the next question from Alonzo Smith. Thanks for the question, family. He said, what is your opinion of the CISSP? So, you know, I have friends who are working toward the CISSP. And my understanding is that um, you need it. You need that certification for federal contracts, right? So if you're going that, down that route, then get it. If your job is paying for you, get it. But more importantly, you know, uh, get understanding of the material that's in that CISSP. You know, uh, just don't get the cert because there's so many, you know, probably test dumps where you can just get the cert, you know, but um, all these certifications get the understanding, you know, and I think that's more important. I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. All right. Let me see. Here's the next question from Afri P. Well, actually, let me go back. Let me go back because you may know this. There was a question from um, Tiffany Monet in the question or Monet. The question is, by chance, are there any meetup groups in South Florida? There is a um, I don't know if it's in South Florida, but there is one in Florida. Uh, it's run by a guy named uh, Rashad. I'm, I'm sorry, Rasul um, Shabazz. It's called the Cyber Jedi. Right. Um, and he's actually and it's virtual uh, and they do it every Tuesday. And I don't, I don't have the link, but if you can do like Florida meetup group, cybersecurity, Miami, um, cyber Jedi, then you, you can find them. And he's a very good guy. He used to run a user group with me in Chicago as well. So, um, and then sometimes I will host this group. He can host mine as well and present. So we sometimes um, change up if uh, we can't make the user group, but it's a very good one. All right, I think I found it. I think I found it. I put it in the chat. Hopefully that's the right one. But yeah, cool. I'm going to take one more question before okay. we out of here. Uh, this last question is from Afri P. It says, besides configuration and administration, how can one get started or create a pathway regarding architecture and designing virtual network security, cloud security, data center security? So basically, how can you get started with the higher level architectural cybersecurity stuff? Just do it. You know, get the AWS account. They have a free tier account. They have one for uh, Google. They have one for Azure. And um, just do it. Get an account. And look at a YouTube video of somebody doing the exact same thing and just follow along. Awesome. Just get started. Get yep. started. Um, is, is there any platforms that you recommend for training? Like for higher level of knowledge? No, just the same thing that we, we talked about, those same courses. You know. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool, cool. Well, look, I want to thank everybody for your questions. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Otha, you want to take us out today? <laughs> just <laughs> thank you. You know, just everybody uh, uh, lab hard, hack every day, get you a training schedule and practice two to three hours a day, and that's it. Awesome. And how how can people contact you? Uh, you can contact me in my user group or um, uh, I don't know, you know, my Twitter, the at the only one author on Twitter as well. <laughs> the only one author. Yep. <laughs> for sure. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. All right. Thanks, guys.